All right. Well, welcome everybody. As uh, you can tell, we've got a handful. Uh, some folks having some internet problems this evening, but uh, it is good to see you. Thank you for making the effort to be here. And uh, if by chance you get disconnected, please give me a, a, a text. Let me know. I'll try to be watching to let you back into the room uh, as best I can. Let's pray together and we'll begin our lesson number four. Let's pray. Lord, as we look into your word, I thank you for the opportunity that we have. I thank you for the chance that we have to grow closer to one another as well as closer to you. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us uh, as we connect the things that we have learned uh, to our lives uh, and, and the world that we live in. Uh, these real problems and real life solutions that you give uh, they are still as valuable today as ever before. So just uh, allow us to learn from you and learn from your word tonight. And uh, may we learn from one another as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, guys, thanks for being here. We're going to go ahead and jump off and get started. This is the First Corinthians uh, lesson number four. Let me kind of scoot this over. And again, I will just tell you, as I have before in the past, uh, if you guys need uh, any kind of questions or have any kind of input that you'd like, just wave me down. I've got you pulled up, so hopefully we can see uh, you and uh, what's going on in you know, your head. Uh, you can share it with us. As we begin, let's begin as we usually do with the review. Let me just remind you that the review is not just uh, simply uh, to waste time. It is an opportunity for us to kind of go back through what we may be applying tonight, pay special and close attention this evening as we go through our review, because there are going to be some things that we discuss later that do have to do with the things that we're talking about. And actually tonight, I think there might be an opportunity for us to take the different things that we've learned, different points in the lessons, and pull them in and just kind of tr start to try to synthesize them a little bit and a little bit deeper level of understanding in the book of First Corinthians as you talk about, okay, I know about this is happening. This is what he's saying. I bet he might be talking about this particular instance. So let's pay close attention. And uh, also repetition is the key to learning. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, but repetition is actually the key to learning. It's true. Repetition is truly the key to learning. All right, you just heard it three times. There you go. All right, so according to 1 Corinthians 7, y'all go ahead and uh, be ready. You can leave your stuff on unmute tonight uh, at the first part especially. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what was the marital status of Peter and Paul? Peter was married, Paul was married. Peter was unmarried, Paul was unmarried. Peter was married, Paul was unmarried. Peter was unmarried, Paul was married. Peter Paul lived with Mary to form an 80 60 pop group called Peter Paul and Mary. <laughs> Some of you don't know that that's funny, but trust me, that's hilarious. Uh, if I do say so myself, 80 60s, do you get that? That's, that's so good. It's so good. All right. Um, so what is the answer? Everybody, anybody, nobody, somebody. What is the correct answer? A, B, C, D. Please don't tell me you think it's E. Paul was unmarried. That's correct. Paul was unmarried. And Peter was? Married. Married. Okay. Looks like we are one for one. There it is. Peter was married and Paul was unmarried. So married. Guys, this question, why is that a big deal? We talked a little bit in passing about that. Why is that a big deal? You guys remember? You do, Sabrina? You took your head. <laughs> well, it was Paul's choice not to be married. It was Paul's choice not to be married. That's definitely he, true. He, but why is it significant that Paul uh, that Peter was married? Who was considered to be the first pope? Peter. Peter, and uh, you know how all the popes are uh, unmarried men, right? And so mm -hmm. Peter was married. There's a little bit of a disconnect there. And, uh, I got onto a big old rant last week. Not a big old but it's a small rant at least about the uh, about the way that uh, the Bible sometimes trips up man's uh, theories sometimes, right? Okay, so we talked about how long did Paul stay in the city of Corinth when he began or planted that church? 
we talked about him staying there for about 18 months. Was this longer than normal or was this about normal? Longer. longer than normal. Definitely longer than normal. So how long was a normal length of stay? This is kind of a hard question, but if you guys can jump in, have any, any remembrances there? Anyone? Six weeks. Three. To three. three to Yes. Okay. So it is approximately six to seven weeks on the low end, 4.3 months on the high end is what the, the math will tell us. So Paul was not staying very long. You remember that we talked about how Paul talked in the very beginning about how he was not there to impress people. Uh, he said, I decided among you that I was not going to be coming with you, you know, coming at you with these you know, very uh, eloquent words, but instead I would just let the power of God shine through whatever was said was going to be something that brought the glory to the Lord alone. And if you remember that, this is part of why we said that was probably true. We knew that a church based on a personality that was going to be leaving in a few weeks or a few months wasn't going to stand the test of time. And so because of that, he didn't base it on that. He based it on the power of God alone. And that's really important and significant. And also, do you remember in Acts chapter 18, God appeared to Paul and said, I have many people here in the city of Corinth months, which is definitely longer than normal. Oops. So what city did Paul voluntarily stay longer than any other city during his missionary journey? Thessalonica, Colossae, Rome, Ephesus, Corinth, or Houston? Corinth. 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 Corinth was 18 months, but there was one that was longer. Houston. <laughs> Although the Lord has been in bad. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer to this is actually Ephesus. Ephesus, he stayed for two full years. Now, Rome, he did not stay there voluntarily. Remember, he was a prisoner. And number of the prison epistles that he wrote, number of the letters that he wrote to other churches, he wrote during his uh, incarceration. He may have stayed a good deal longer as a prisoner in Rome, two to four plus years but he voluntarily stayed in Ephesus for two years, and more than likely, that's where he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. All right, this is a hard one. This is a hard one. I know we have at least one person on the, on the deal Oops. here right, that is a big fan of the book of Acts. Some very important decisions were made at the council at blank. Detailed for us in Acts chapter 15. The council at you remember. I'm going to look up Acts chapter 15. It was called the council at Jerusalem. I'm going to fill it in for you. You guys remember that the Christians, they had that big discussion on whether or not Christians had to be circumcised to be Christian. They went back and forth. There were some that said, well, you know, hey, it's really important that they be circumcised. And Peter, you know, and Paul and all of them were there. They went through a big decision and discussion. And at the end, they decided that Christians don't have to be circumcised to become Christians. And they also said that Peter was the one who was called to go to the Jews and Paul was called to go to the Gentiles. Now, very quickly, I'm going to go ahead and hit all of you guys on mute real quick. Here. Everybody but me. And uh, sure we got all that. Um, okay, so here we go. This is where Corinth is located, right here on this very, very, very thin area of land. There was a 3.9 mile long stretch of land right here that adjoined the Ionian Sea and the Aegean Sea here, right near the Mediterranean Sea. Many ships would go in this way and cross a land bridge here at the city of Corinth. Because of that, it was a huge place of people gathering as well as people, um, you know, kind of from other cultures kind of clashing, which is a really, really good uh, illustration of how a modern city of that time looked and felt and all, all the problems and issues that had to be dealt with. Now, 
I don't know if you guys remember, but the first couple of weeks I put this up and this might be worth your time. If any of you really want to understand Paul, the missionary journeys in the life of Paul, you might grab your photo, you know, you might grab your camera, take a picture of this on your screen. The timeline of St. Paul's life and missionary journey, it gives you a, ge a general idea of his birth all the way through his death and what was going on, the different missionary journeys where he went, what the time uh, frame was and all that. It's really good and it will probably help you out. All right, so I have time for one or two. If you read chapters 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians, at least you should have read that. Now's the time to turn in your homework. Um, so if you read those chapters, you're going to have to unmute yourself, but tell me at least one thing that jumped out to you in chapters 8 through 10 that was kind of interesting. You can tell me why you thought it was interesting or whatever, uh, if you choose to. If not, you can just tell me, hey, this jumped out to me. Anybody? You will have to unmute yourself here. Anyone? I think 19 for me, the first 19. First 19 of which chapter? Uh, or, or tell me what it says. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's a very interesting passage of scripture. I actually think that is kind of one of the main passages that can teach us what this whole section of First Corinthians is really all about. And so I appreciate you calling that one out. It is really interesting to see the heart of Paul, the man who basically spent all of, you know, a good part of his life traveling around and sharing the cause of Christ with everyone he possibly could in city after city after city. He tells us, he said, I, I made myself a, a person who fit in every single place, made myself something that could identify with all people because I wanted them to understand that the cause of Christ and, and the word of Christ was for them. Good stuff. Good observation. Donna, good stuff. Anyone else? Another passage that jumped out to you? Uh, if you read that passage of scripture, chapters 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, anything that just jumped out and grabbed you? Anything? Um, I have two of my favorite uh, scriptures of all time. Oh, um, from these, <laughs> uh, at the moment at least, but like from, uh, let me see. So we got chapter 9, verse 26. Okay. So, yeah, it's a good one. Let's see, yeah. So therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. And then if he keeps going, no, I strike a blow with my body and make it uh, my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. I just think it's a good like analogy as to like the passion that we should have for Christ and like just this whole journey that we're having. Like instead of kind of just like lazing around, we kind of like have to be like a runner. I like that, like a wrestler or whatever. Yeah, that's fantastic. I like that. It's fantastic. Yeah, that was one of my favorites, too. Yeah, yeah. it's a good example. It's, it makes yes. it easier when you have, like, an analogy to reference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> you already had your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then chapter 10, verse 13. Um, where are we? Ooh, okay, this one's really good. So, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So it's just like, a, I feel like everyone faces a sort of temptation at some point in their life. And it's just nice to know that there is a way out through God. And it's never going to be like, I don't know, temptation is kind of hard to kind of deal with. Because it's always like, you know, I can't do anything to overcome it. But like right there, it says you can. <laughs> mm, that's it's fantastic. Just, yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorites. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Sabrina? Uh, if you'd like to teach next week, uh, I may be gone. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't want to embarrass you in your own study. <laughs> All kidding aside, that is fantastic. I appreciate it. Very good stuff. All right. Well, let's keep moving. And we are doing things a little different this week, or not this week, but this, uh, this time around where I share the big idea. Hopefully you catch it as we go through, and then we'll reiterate it at the end. Here's the big takeaway from lesson four. At the end, hopefully you will see it. In 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, chapters 8, 9, and 10, 
Paul speaks about how Christian maturity acts in real life. You know, it's, it's funny because we, we sometimes credit people with Christian maturity and Paul just kind of tells, this is what it looks like in real life. The world believes that greatness is served by others, but Christ taught that true greatness serves others. It's a big difference. It's a huge difference. And in the process of all this that we read tonight, you'll see that in a lot of ways, Paul is saying, we're, we're here to serve others. We're not here to be served. We're not here to get our way. We're not here to demand our rights. We're here to make sure that we're serving others with our entire life. I lay my life down so that others can benefit. And immature Christians can fall into the same trap as, you know, the world does. The Corinthian church did. They were all about trying to make sure that they exercised their freedom to the fullest extent. They were all about making sure they got their way and that nobody took something away from them that they could, you know, lay a right or a claim to. But the big takeaway here is, is that greatness serves others. That's what Christ taught and what he exemplified. All right, so let's get off into it. From 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 13, this is how to handle foods sacrificed to idols. And so real quickly, I told you guys at the very beginning that this um, is going to be a, a, a time where we kind of synthesize some of the things that we've learned and we bring them all together here. Why do you think in Corinth how to handle food sacrificed to idols would be an issue that needs to be discussed? You guys tell me. Tell me what you've learned already in this study that would tell you why this needs to be discussed. Anyone? I believe the way you do it is you hit the space bar and you've unmuted yourself. And so you don't even have to take yourself off of unmute. All you got to do is hit the space bar and talk. Is that correct, Shelly Puckett? I know you're, you're a, a whiz on this stuff because you're doing Zoom all the time. Uh, is that correct, Shelly? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that works for me. Oh, that is Teresa Guest. Yep. Chiming in. Okay. All right. So oh, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. I didn't get to my button in time. What was your question? I said you hit your you hit your space bar to unmute yourself there. <laughs> yes, on on Zoom. I'm actually on my phone because I'm still having internet issues, so I'm on data here. Oh, sorry about that. My bad. Um, okay. No, all good. So why would this discussion be something that's happening in Corinthians with the Corinthians on how to handle food that is sacrificed to idols? Somebody tell me. I know you got this. Because of the temple to Athena? The temple to there. Athena and also the temple to another person. That's good, by the way. Who's the other? One was a goddess, that was Athena. And then the, the god was who? I forgot. <laughs> Is another A, his name? Was it Apollo? Apollo, that is right. The ruins of the temple of Apollo in Corinth was happening as well. And so, no, it's good. So why would they be talking about food sacrifice to idols? Well, all of these temples are going on in Corinth. It seems that meat was being sold in local markets after having been offered to idols but not used up. Do you guys understand? So put this together in your head. Food is sacrificed on an altar and given to Apollo or given to Athena or any of the other different temples that are there in Corinth. And then some of the temple, you know, workers would use some of the meat and some of the meat would not actually be used. So what they would do is they would take that meat, they would take it to a local market. And by the way, this is not... Uh, this is not the attire of people in the ancient world. This is a modern meat market, okay? I'm not trying to pretend this is an ancient meat market. But you you guys, have have any of you guys seen like a modern uh, meat market where they hang food? Have you all ever seen that kind of thing? Okay, let me tell you this. If you tell me certain things are certain things, um, I couldn't tell you that you're right or wrong. I'm going to be honest with you. If you're like, you see that chunk of meat up there, that's pork. 
And I'm like, okay. And they're like, no, just kidding. It's beef. It's like, mm, okay, well, I don't know either one until I take it home and I'm not going to get to take it home until I buy it. Well, think about this for just a quick second. There were Jews in the church at Corinth. And guess what, church, guess what Jews don't get to eat? They don't get to eat pork. That's right. It, yeah, I, I read your lips, uh, Frank. I read your lips. You said, <laughs> you said, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> they do not get to eat pork. But sometimes they would go to the meat market and they would have different cuts of meat. And some of them was sacrificed to idols. Some of them were just, you know, from the, from the fields. And they were all mixed in together. And so the question for the people at Corinth was, Paul, what happens if we eat meat and we find out later it had been sacrificed to idols? Or it's even a possibility that people said, Paul, can I just be real with you? Man, our family doesn't have a ton of extra money. And they sell it cheaper if it's from the temple. And I don't even think that it matters to me. Like the food that's been sacrificed to an idol, I know that that idol's not a thing in the world. It doesn't mean anything to me. I have given that up. I've walked away from that. Can I just go ahead and buy that? Because I can have that food that I couldn't afford, but it would be good for my family. But it doesn't change the way that I feel about Christ, nor does it change the way that I feel about that idol that is nothing but a block of wood in my view. You see how this could be a really interesting conversation? And so the question begins and says, okay, now what do we do with food sacrifice to idols? So as you know, in the book of 1 Corinthians and other chapters uh, in 2 Corinthians as well, Paul goes through and he talks about Hey, this is a problem. This is how we fix it. This is a problem you've asked me about. This is how you fix it. This is something that you ask me, what do I think about marriage? What do I think about unity? What do I think about food sacrifice to idols? What do I think about all of these other things? You need to quit, quit this, correct this. He's doing all of that. He tackles food sacrifice to idols. Let's hear what he has to say. So then about eating food sacrifice to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, these things in quotes, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is, no, there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom all live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God, and we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. But be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. It's an interesting passage of scripture here. It's a really interesting passage of scripture. Let's talk about some questions for interaction here. Engage your imagination. Why do you think that the problem of meat sacrifice to idols was on the list that they wanted Paul to clarify for them? We've already talked a little bit about that. But is there a principle that we can take from this beyond simply buying groceries, right? Um, is there a difference uh, in the things that we've learned here from these passages of Scripture. Anybody want to take a stab at what the thoughts are here? What is Paul telling us beyond just the concept of buying groceries? Anyone? That can go for, you know, whatever you do, if 
a person um, is not as strong in their faith and you do something and they think it's wrong, uh, you know, against, or it'll make them stumble, then it's something that you shouldn't continue to do, even though you may think it's okay and you know the reason behind it because you're a stronger Christian than they are, but if not, then you shouldn't do it because of their weakness. I think that is the principle that we have to be uh, aware of. Now, this is a balance here in that we need to be very careful that we don't say, well, somebody who's been following Christ for 10 years is offended at this situation or that situation. Well, that's not really a weaker brother. That's a person who's in Christ that knows better and should have already grown into understanding that each person stands before the Lord and not before the least person that might judge them. But for example, or for instance, there are a lot of things in our world that are culturally, um, they shift from place to place. For example, the, for instance, um, it's a funny thing. Uh, I've been, I've spent some time in Mexico and, uh, one of the things that they think is one of the greatest sins that you can commit in Mexico is they see you smoking a cigarette, they think it is absolutely horrible and forbidden that you are uh, a big time sinner if you're smoking a cigarette. That's what their culture is affected deeply by. It's a funny thing because some of the things that uh, maybe we think a little bit more, uh, make, maybe take a little bit more offense of here in the United States don't affect them there in the same way. It's funny because each person has this set of things that is maybe more offensive to them. But I'm going to take one real quickly, and I'll just say this. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to go in any way, way down this line, but let me just kind of give you a quick example. For most people, about 90% of people, gambling is something that you might do occasionally. You might go to a casino you know, throw down a couple dollars, throw a couple of uh, dice, pull a lever or two and walk away. For about 8% to 10% of the people in the population, it can be an addiction that they can never walk away from, right? I mean, that's about 10% of gambling addiction is about what it affects the population. Well, here's the deal. I don't say that you shouldn't gamble. That's not at all what I'm saying. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. But if you lead somebody to Christ and you say, hey, I just want you to know, you know, this, this and that, that. And you tell them all about Christ and that kind of thing. And they say, well, that's great because maybe Christ can save me from my gambling addiction. You don't probably need to say, well, I go to the casino every other weekend, you know, or something <laughs> like that. Right. Or if their struggle is with alcohol or if their struggle is with the sexual addiction or any of these addictions that we understand, there's tons of addictions that are out there that afflict people. The Lord is there to provide the freedom from that. We don't need to say, oh, you're so free that you can keep indulging in that. Because the truth is, is that each one of us has a problem in different areas of our lives. And what Paul is trying to communicate, I think, the principle is, we need to be careful that just because we're free from something that we don't act like that. Well, everybody should be free from that. So it's no problem because each one of us has a difficult time with certain and specific sins and problems. For example, again, you know, there are some people that you'd say, here's a, a, just a ton of money for you. And they'd say, great, this is awesome. I can use this in these ways to be a blessing. But you give it to some people, maybe about 10 or 20%, and a ton of money will change their character like that, right? You've met that kind of pe uh, person where the more the, that they get or gain, the more difficult they are to ever talk to, see that they've done anything wrong, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a list a mile long of the things that can enslave. What Paul is trying to convey here is, you gotta be careful that you don't just simply say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm free to do anything and everything. Do you remember what the uh, Corinthians said? They even wrote to Paul in the letter, I'm free to do anything. But Paul said, but wait, 
if you do those things, it's, you be very careful because you might become enslaved to those things that were just so free for you for a while. And so I think it's important for us to grasp and understand that the principle that we take here is we're very careful with things that could enslave, and we don't need to make those decisions, especially for younger Christians or people that are new in Christ. They may be struggling, and they may see us and say, you know, it's okay, because they're a Christian, they're a good Christian, and they do these things, but it may be the very thing that's enslaving them that they need freedom from, that Christ came to give freedom from, if that makes sense. There's a lot, a lot I just said there. I, that's kind of a discussion more than just like, hey, here's a three hard and fast rules that you take. But I think Paul is going deep on that and, and having a discussion with them about those things. Any questions, comments, thoughts, any observations, or maybe you've had something that you've heard or seen in your own life and uh, your own experience uh, along those lines. Anyone? Anyone? Do you remember, let's keep going here. Do you remember the big problem that they had at the very beginning? In 1 Corinthians, he begins, he says, this is what I mean. One of you says, I follow Paul. One says, I follow Apollos. One says, I follow Cephas. One other person says, I follow Christ. Paul was the founder and the apostle who came to them first. He wasn't out to impress with great personality, great rhetoric. Apollos was articulate. He was smart. And Cephas, who was a man who was a Jewish name, right? Who is that name for? Cephas is the Jewish name for who? Go ahead, hit that Peter. button. Peter, <laughs> exactly. But probably Peter never actually came to Corinth, but that group probably leaned towards the Jewish law and keeping the Jewish law because they called Peter by his Jewish name. So let's go back to the food sacrifice to idols. You guys know kosher? You've heard of kosher? Not just kosher salt, but kosher pickles. You've heard of kosher beef, et cetera, et cetera. Kosher literally means fit or appropriate. There's some things that you can have and some things that aren't kosher that you cannot have. If you actually look at this kind of real quickly, you can kind of see why the Lord had some food restrictions for the Jews. A lot of these things, when there was no modern refrigeration, when there was no good way to keep these things, they would go bad and spoil a lot quicker than a lot of these meats. And there was also just the, the problem of parasites and infections and stuff with some of these other things. But let's be very clear about what was probably going on, and I'll sum it up in two words. Church potluck. <laughs> so you know, I know that you guys think that I just like to get together because I love to eat. No, I'm trying to be biblical. How dare you think of those things about me just because I'm an overweight dude? Well, here's the deal. Here's the problem. When you are having a church potluck and you've got some that are bringing food that's been sacrificed to idols and some that won't eat it, and you've got some that are trying to be kosher, and some that don't care, and you're supposed to be all together as one body, it gets real complicated real fast, doesn't it? And what's going to happen? A united church coming together to sit down to eat. Here, I made this. Try this. Uh, no, I won't be trying your food because I'm sorry. I'm too good to try that food, right? Or I don't believe that you're actually living the, le the way that Christ would have you to live when you're dealing with these foods, so I won't be trying your food. I mean, talk about a way to put a split between people. Can you see how quickly this thing that's supposed to be unifying people can start tearing them apart, right? You understand what I'm saying? And so if you look at these things and grasp them, let's talk a little bit more about it. So what does Christian maturity look like opposed to immaturity within the body of believers? Paul starts talking about, I've got freedom and I've got rights. As an apostle, even, I've got freedom, I've got rights. What does he say? We're jumping from 1 Corinthians chapter 8 into 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 6, he says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen the Lord? 
Are you not the results of my work in the Lord? And then listen to this verse especially. Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you're the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Then he goes on, he says, this is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles, the Lord's brothers, and Cephas or Peter? Or is it only I and Barnabas who, ha- who lack the right to not work for a living? Here's what else is going on. Here's what else is going on. Other churches that Paul had started before he had come to Corinth paid the bills for the expenses of Paul's financial support personally and the costs of starting the Corinthian church. He was asking them to pay for these brand new believers in Christ. Now let's keep going a little further. In 2 Corinthians, there's still a problem. And Paul says, listen, Corinthian believers, I don't want you to think I'm in the least little bit inferior to those super apostles over there. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it a sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And then he says, and when I was with you and needed something, I wasn't a burden to you. The brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I kept myself from being a burden to you in any way, and I'm going to continue to do so. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in the regions of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Is it because I don't love you? God knows I do. Just notice these are from 2 Corinthians. He's talking about these very same principles in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. It's not just the rights of an apostle, but it's also how people are perceiving other people as on their level or underneath their level, as good enough or not good enough, as we're brothers or you're a little beneath me. It's all happening at the table. It's happening when Paul is not asking them to pay for his financial support. And he keeps going. Think about this, what you know from our study. Why do you think that the Corinthian believers thought Paul was less than some of these other apostles? Let's talk about that. Do you remember why? Talk about why real quickly. I know some of you guys, you know this. Anyone there? Well, what did Paul say? He said, I am not going to try to be wise among you. I'm going to be humble among you. I'm not going to present myself as some vaunted person. And then in that time, in the biblical teachers, they would go from church to church. And when they would go from church to church, they would say, I'm a pretty famous preacher. I'm a pretty famous teacher. So I'm going to need you to give me some sort of financial gift that's commiserate with how important and how special I am. You guys with me? What did Paul say he wasn't doing? He was not asking them to pay at all because he wanted to present the gospel of Christ free of charge to them. Other churches paid. He gave those services for free. Go ahead, Donna. You started to say something. I was saying that he's, he was not boastful. He was not boastful. Exactly. Yeah. And so all of this is going on and all of this is making the Corinthian believers think, this guy, Paul, no, 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 no. You know, each and everything just dropping him in their eyes, all done for their benefit, but yet all done in such a way that they won't give him the credit that he deserves. And why was there even a Cephas faction when Peter had never even visited? Probably because some people were desperate to be of the circumcision group. They're the ones who said, no, 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 we still follow the kosher laws, even though they were living in a Gentile city going to a church 
where Christ proclaimed everything to be free to eat. And they're still trying to keep the Jewish law because it makes them feel better about themselves. Are you guys with me so far? Okay, so keep going. Let's think about also who was Paul? Paul was a man in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 9. This is his conversion experience. Meanwhile, Saul, who later became known as Paul, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any of those who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, he suddenly had a light from heaven flash around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the voice or he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And the men traveling there with Saul stood speechless because they heard the sound but did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground. When he opened his eyes, he could not see anything. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and didn't eat or drink anything. Now for your information, for a person to be considered an apostle, he could not be an apostle unless he had seen the Lord face to face. This is Paul's face to face interaction with the Lord. So when he declares himself to be an apostle, there were some who probably said, yeah, but is he really? I mean, is he really an apostle? Because after all, we know about Peter, we know about James, we know about John. They were actually there. They saw him face to face. But Paul only saw him face to face in a vision. So is he really actually on the same level as these other apostles? You know, I don't follow Paul. I follow Cephas. Because I know that Cephas saw Jesus face to face. Do you see this craziness going on? Can you understand and grasp, like, like put this together with what Paul is saying. He's saying in 2 Corinthians, he's saying it in 1 Corinthians. He's like, look, even if you want to say that I'm not an apostle, surely I'm an apostle for you. You came to know Christ through my teaching and through my preaching. I was sent. An apostle basically means one who is sent. I was sent to you to come and share the word of God with you. And I even did so in such a way that you didn't have to pay a dime. You didn't have a dime to pay that you wanted to hear from some Bible teacher, some Jewish Bible teacher. So I didn't ask for a dime. I asked somebody else to pay so that you could hear the gospel. And that's why I'm here. And now, instead of saying, wow, what an incredible blessing we've received, you say, eh, Paul's not really that impressive. Or he, you're saying, he, if he was really a great teacher, he'd demand money for his services. Do you see how twisted this is getting? And in the midst of it all, who is the one who is truly great? And who is the one who is truly serving? It's Paul. Paul's the one who's saying, you know what? I'm serving you, whether you want me to or not, whether you respect me or not, I'm serving you because that's what I'm doing as the person who's the father in Christ for you. It's really important that we grasp that. Now, he goes on and he says in 1 Corinthians 15, I received, I passed on to you as first of importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day. He appeared to Cephas, remember, and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. And though some have even fallen asleep, but then he appeared to James, all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me as well as one who is abnormally born. Paul's not pretending to be something that he's not, but he's saying, you know what? I am an apostle, but I'm different than the rest. 
And he says, for I'm least of all the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Then he goes on and he says, no, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me. And then I, I made a little typo here. Sorry about that. But clearly Paul was seen as different in the eyes of some in the early church from the original 12 apostles. Also clearly, this was not always seen as something that was positive. You guys understand? And so in the midst of all of this that's going on, Paul is saying, I want you to understand I might be different than you expect, but I'm here to serve you first and foremost. But then Paul goes into something and he says, you might not agree with all of this, but I want you to understand from my perspective where I'm coming from. He says, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and doesn't eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and doesn't drink the milk? Do I merely say this on human authority, but doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely God's saying this for us, isn't he? Yes, this is written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing the harvest. If we have sown a spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we didn't use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I haven't used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me now. I'd rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. So you see what Paul is saying? He's saying, I did all of these things to benefit you, and now somehow it's made you think that I was less than these other people who have demanded more of you and done less for you. I'm going to say that again. Paul basically is saying, I, did, I, I demanded less of you and did more of you, or did more for you, than these people who have demanded more from you and done less for you. And you think these are the good guys and that I'm the worthless one. Well, I will just say that spiritual parenting, according to Paul, sounds an awful lot like real parenting sometimes, right? <laughs> you do more for your kids than anybody else ever does. And you, they think they're the greatest and you're the worst. <laughs> well, Paul was like, hold on just a second. Don't get this twisted around. The truth is, is that I've done all these things so that you might understand the power of God. And that's so important. All right. Any questions, any comments, any thoughts? We're coming close to the end. We've just got a handful more slides. Anyone? Questions, thoughts, or comments? Anyone? Let's talk about what this Christian freedom looks like very quickly. And we'll talk a little bit more about food sacrifice to idols next week. He talks about it, talks about the rights of an apostle, then comes back to the food sacrifice to idols. Let's talk about 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 27. Christian freedom that's laid aside the desire to see others one for Christ. Though I am free... I belong to no one. I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. That's the one that Donna mentioned earlier. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. But I did it to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, I'm under Christ's law. I did it so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share 
in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly, and I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is also something that was mentioned earlier as jumping out. Here's what Paul is saying. Every single sacrifice I made, I made so that somebody could identify with me and they would grasp that the gospel of Christ can meet you wherever you are. And if it meets you wherever you are, it can free you from whatever you are bound by. He talks about that in the area of food sacrifice to idols. And in the process of that, he shares with them and says, you know, a lot of you have learned that the idols that are made of wood and stone, they're not really living idols. You used to live to go to their temple. Now you don't care. You used to be slaves to them. You used to have to bow and do all of these different things every single day just to show your uh, a devotion and affection. You don't do those things anymore. Why? Because now you know better because Christ has set you free. It's an interesting thing about the world and the truth of Christian leadership. I want to just share something with you. This is a diagram that I think captures some things in Christian leadership versus the world. In the world, the higher you go in leadership, the more options you have. It's like a funnel. In other words, when you're the low man on the totem pole, you have to be there at a certain time. You stay the whole time and you never leave. And if you don't you know, show up, then you don't get paid right? But as you go a little higher up and a little higher up, you have a few more options. Maybe you have some vacation days. Maybe you have some benefits that you don't have to worry so much about. Maybe you get some positives where your education help, you know, things like that. And the further you go up, the, the top man at the totem pole, you can get all the you know, all the salary that you hope for. And a lot of times that's not always true, but you know what I'm saying. You can have a little bit more freedom to come and go as you please. The guy who owns the business may not even show up for the business every day, but the guy at the bottom has no options. The guy at the top has all kinds of options. But here's how it is in the kingdom. Paul said, at the bottom of the pyramid of the kingdom, if you're a brand new Christian, you can do whatever you want doesn't really matter because it doesn't really affect people. But the further up you go in Christian leadership, the fewer options that you have. This is actually true because the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, somebody who just became a Christian probably won't denounce the name of Christ, but somebody who keeps going further and further in Christian leadership. I mean, we've seen this, right? A little bit of a screw up. The, the huge impact that it can have on kingdom and perception of the kingdom, right? Why? Because there's fewer and fewer options whenever you go up in the kingdom versus up in the world. Here, Paul said, I make myself basically accountable to everybody so that everybody might see Christ living in me. The truth of the matter is, is that for most of us, as we go a little higher we want to retain these options. Well, what I do doesn't matter. Well, it actually does. The higher that you go in influence in the kingdom, you have to watch yourself more closely. It's not that you have no options, but you just got to be careful that that freedom that, you're, that you have doesn't hurt the, the freedom and, the, and the, the life for other people. So this is a, a good way of seeing it. And we see here, talking about Christian maturity and how it acts in real life, the world believes greatness is served by others. Christ taught true greatness actually serves others. Immature Christians fall into the same trap 
the Corinthian church did, thinking that true greatness had to be served. That's why Paul wasn't great. He wasn't being served. Well, uh, that's not really true at all. All right. So questions, thoughts, or comments? Anybody have any questions, thoughts, or comments? Anyone? I can let say something. Yes, yeah. It's muted, then. No. No, you're not muted. You can you can be heard. You want to say something? I just there was just so much division in the Corinthian church that Paul was just reproving them to just get people uh, to get them to do the truth of God's word. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the book of Corinthians, just a reproof of their era. I definitely agree. And the more that you read in the book of Corinthians, first Corinthians, the more you realize the early church was not some perfect place of Christianity in its perfect form. It's just a whole lot like the church that we live in, in the modern world. It's, it's a lot of sinfulness and then overcoming it with God's grace. And it's a lot of confusion it's a lot of times where we want to separate and divide into units instead of have unity, um, where we want to demand our rights instead of being servants. We want to be served. Um, and that happens in the modern church a lot. So there's a lot to right. take away for sure. Good comment, Frank. Appreciate that. Anyone else or anyone have a few more words to say? Okay, well, let me remind you that this passage uh, or this uh, lesson is entitled First Corinthians, God's Power for Your Real Life Problems. I want to just kind of shift it back and remind you that the truth is, is that whether it's desiring to be served rather than serving, or it's the lack of unity, or if it's even the concept of, well, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. It won't affect anybody and I'm free in Christ. You know, all of these things are things that we as Christians have to work our way through and figure out. And we come back to the place where we say, I think according to that last little bit, I think the thing that is being challenged there is this. Why waste your life with something that is like an aimless run? Like, put your face forward, lean into it, and give your very best to the Lord. I mean, there's so many things that we keep in our lives that really don't matter to us, but they're easier to keep than to discard. But what Paul is saying, he's like, man, I don't approach my life that way. I approach my life like there's one winner to this race, and if there's only one winner, it's going to be me. And if I don't win, I'm going to come in second <laughs> or and if I'm not second, third, because I'm going to give it my all. But for many of us as Christians, we're not giving it our all. We're giving it less than our best by a long stretch. And I think that passage that says, no, 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 I'm running this race to win it. And reminding us that there is something eternal that waits for the winners of this race um, is something really important. So anyway, I think that's where I will end unless somebody else has a comment or a question. Anyone? One thing I wanted to say is that Paul was, he was really relentless in his preaching because you can, you can tell how many, how much time that he spent just really talking and talking and talking and talking, you know, like, um, just to get them to understand him, to bring them together. And he didn't give up. And like he says, it, it, he was running the race not only for himself, but for every, for all the Christians, you know, to bring them together, to unite them, and get them to see, you know, where they're where they're wrong at, so that they can fix it and move on to be better people, serving God. Excellent. Yeah. Amen. Great, great comment and great observation. Lot, lot of great comments and observation tonight. Um, thank you guys for your part. I appreciate it. Um, honestly, uh, I appreciate your part so much tonight. Thank you. 
And thanks for your attendance and being here. Don't forget we're having communion this coming Sunday, uh, whether virtual or in person. Hope that you will participate and be a part of that. And uh, God bless you guys as you finish your week. Uh, run to win the race, you guys. And may God bless you as you do. I love you guys. Y'all stay safe. Take care. Good night. Thank you. What are we reading for next week? Oh. <laughs> so you got homework. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm that one student. Hello, homework. <laughs> I'd be glad to give you homework. Read chapters 10 through 12. Basically just you, Sabrina. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. God bless y'all. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye.